20. I do want to go back a little bit and start reading in verse 43. Um, what a surprise. David finds himself in some trouble. Uh, and so we read last week really about the context of that trouble and how it came about with David's um, in the inactivity between the disagreements uh, between the northern tribes in Judah, where there's an argument that brews there. So I want to start back at uh, verse 43 of chapter 19, and we're going to read for our opening to verse 2 of chapter 20, but then we're going to take the rest of the story as we come to it very clearly here. So 2 Samuel 19, we'll start in verse 43. And the men of Israel answered the men of Judah and said, We have ten shares in the king, therefore we also have more right to David than you. Why then do you despise us? Were we not the first to advise bringing back our king? Yet the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. And there happened to be there a rebel whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjaminite. And he blew a trumpet and said, We have no share in David, nor do we have inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. So every man of Israel deserted David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah from the Jordan, as far as Jerusalem, remained loyal to their king. First Baptist Church of Grey Gables, the grass, uh, wait, what, the flower, wait, what is it again? What just happened? I just, I lost it. We do this every week. Let's, why don't you say it? You know it? That's true discipleship there. Somebody pray for my brain for the rest of this. <laughs> what happened? All right, I'm going to have to start writing that in my manuscript. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for this text of Scripture. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would give us, Lord, just more light, more understanding. Uh, Father, would you direct our thoughts in this hour to the application of it as we seek to be made more like you through your Spirit through our souls and our benefit and our knowledge of the scriptures. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I should probably open by telling you I have a teething one-year-old. <laughs> so we'll see how this goes. Um, but I have alliterated this outline really very simply in your notes to help you kind of walk through it with us. Um, this is a narrative, so we're going to walk through the narrative, and we're kind of going to apply these things as we go along. It'll be a little bit different than what we usually do looking at biblical theology, but I've got four W's for you being a good Southern Baptist here. The first uh, is we start with uh, the withdrawal. There is a withdrawal here at the beginning. Uh, we've seen in the story of David very clearly how one trouble follows the next David has on his hands another treasonous man, another rebellion in the kingdom, against his kingdom. Sheba is the guy this time. He's, he's actually called by various translators uh, a rebel, or in the King James, maybe you have that there, a man of Belial. He's also known as a worthless man, baseless man, vile man, and they're all correct. The word of God is correct. Sheba uh, is... Vile. It means actually seven, the sacred number. And this Sheba, though, was obviously a man of influence. Enough influence that he could simply blow the trumpet and get the tribes to fall away from David after this argument. And we saw last week how we know that David is at least somewhat responsible for this event due to his deafening silence during the argument that ensued last week. But but David, as we've always seen, even though David fails constantly, David is still the Lord's anointed. And this man, Sheba, has the spirit of Absalom about him. The spirit of rebellion, spirit of treason against the anointed king. Sheba is a man of Benjamin, which is important, which means he, he likely, much like most of the Benjaminites, supposed the days of Saul, who was a Benjaminite, to be better than the days of David. So Sheba seizes on this general quarrel, this argument, and then he tries to undercut and unseat the king once again. And he, he's doing a pretty good job of it. And that he uses this argument as a basis of, of pulling the 10 tribes of Israel away. And so Again, for those of us who know redemptive historical theology, who know the understanding of where the story is going, we see here the seeds of discord among the nation being planted vigorously 
And what's interesting about this is this is only Israel's second reign of the king they wanted so badly. Right? You remember 1 Samuel 8, how desperately they wanted a king? They just had to have a king, remember? Their idea was, if we have a king, then he'll lead us. We can unify around him. He'll fight our battles for us. And now here they are in just their second king. And they're not unified. And really, they, they haven't been, not for very long at least. I feel like there's an application even there for us that we recognize that no earthly king can unify us. You know that, right? Right? We see this in our own nation. Everyone right now complains about the split in our nation, how there's two sides and they are very seemingly an opposite of one another. We, we find this though, this is not new. We find this in nation after nation. An earthly king cannot unify a whole people in a country because the only king who can ever truly unify a people is King Jesus. Only King Jesus is going to win all our battles for us. And so they lusted after this king, thinking he would be so great for them, and here they are, splitting apart in just their second king. What this shows us in this withdrawal is that Sheba was a son of discord, the son of the devil. In his statement, you notice what he says there? He says, we have no share in David. Really? No share in David? And and though we know that David has certainly not reigned in the way he began with wisdom and discernment, making good judgments and so on, the reality is, again, he's still God's anointed. And so if you have no share in David, then what is it you have, Sheba? You're in poverty. It would be just like the world saying, we will not have any share in Jesus. We will not have this man reign over us. That's fine and dandy, but all you have left is a bunch of sinners to rule over you. You have no inheritance in God's anointed, and to have no inheritance in God's anointed is to have no inheritance at all. We see here wicked words that are sown that will find evil ground to grow in Jeroboam's day when the nation will be split in two, when the ten tribes will finally actually separate from the anointed kingship and they follow the northern kingdom. And what do you find there? Remember our Old Testament survey class on the kings, don't you? You find bad fruit, assassination. They never prosper and the northern kingdom of Israel never does after they split. They're the first to be shipped off to a foreign nation because if you have the spirit of Absalom, if you're going to refuse the kingship of David as jacked up as he is right now, then there's nothing left for you. And so it is, friends, for this world as well. If you refuse the kingdom of God, if you refuse the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is nothing left for you but sorrow. So we see here a withdrawal. From there, though, the text abruptly goes into a widowhood in verse 3. This is the widowhood, and this is very interesting. We see this. In verse 3, the word says, Now David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king took the ten women, his concubines, whom he had left to keep the house, and put them in seclusion and supported them, but did not go into them. So they were shut up to the day of their death, living in widowhood. Who are these ten women? Well, these are the ten women that David left behind, which, surprise, surprise, seems to be another misstep on David's part. Because what did Absalom do with these ten women? He takes the opportunity to sleep with them, to show his disdain and rebellion against David. And and so the women are defiled. Now, not sure, we cannot know why they were left by David. It says to keep the house, but certainly we know David's judgment at this point has been shown to be impaired and and, um, not necessarily righteous. So... These now, they're conveyed to widowhood, practically speaking, even though they're not really widows. But what they're saying is David is is dead to them. This, this friends, highlights the evil of everything that's taken place here, particularly the evil of concubines and polygamy, the evil of leaders taking many wives. Listen, I know that it's throughout the Old Testament, 
But that is not prescriptive. That's descriptive. It never worked out well in Israel, and it was never God's ordained plan for his people to have multiple wives. And so David left these women behind to preserve the house. But he should have, as king, and simply as a man of God's own heart, been more concerned for the souls of these women. David, again, shows terrible judgment here. Even if we presume he naively thought his son would never do such a vile thing, he's naive. And so David sets them aside. He, he won't have relations with them anymore. He, he does right in the sight of God in the sense that he takes care of them and feeds them. They live comfortably in the house of David. He cannot divorce them because they have, they've done no wrong. So he makes them as comfortable as possible. And, and, and friends, we're meant to read their widowhood as a tragedy and we're meant to be reminded even in the midst of that, that David's greater son, our Lord Jesus, is not polygamous. The Lord Jesus has one bride. And that bride he loves. That bride he tends for. That bride he protects, even though the world may abuse his bride. For her bridegroom is yet alive. She shall never be in widowhood. Never. Because Christ is alive. She, the church, his bride, shall have all her tears wiped away, and she shall dwell with David's greater son forever. She shall dine with him, converse with him, have spiritual intimacy with Christ forever and ever. We, friends, will never be in widowhood with Jesus. We will always be married to our gracious Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, widowhood is only for this life and this world not for the world to come. The text then goes into this situation with Joab, and oh boy, if you thought verse 3 was interesting, it's about to get real interesting. Um, we're going to see in verse three, or verses 4 and on what would I would call some wallowing. Okay, So we've seen a withdrawal, widowhood, and now we're going to see some wallowing. Um, in fact, before we do this, there are two crucial facts we need to go back and look at, particularly about this guy, Joab, who I don't know about you, but, but at the beginning, I knew Joab, but this study in 2 Samuel has really enlightened my eyes to this guy being a character. This dude is worth a case study, uh, Joab. He's an interesting fellow, but I want to look at two facts here. First, I want to go back to 2 Samuel 17, verse 25, and I want to read something for you. It says this, in Absalom, okay, so this is during the rebellion, Absalom made Amasa captain of the army instead of Joab. This Amasa was the son of a man whose name was Jithra, an Israelite who had gone into Abigail, the daughter of Nahash, sister of Zariah, Joab's mother. So, so this man Amasa becomes the general of the army that's fighting against David. He, he's in on the treason. And yet this is who David brings in to lead his army. Why? Because you remember what Joab did, right? Joab killed Absalom. To prevent further bloodshed in the war, he killed David's son. And David is upset with Joab now again. In fact, it says this in 2 Samuel 19, verse 13. And say to Amasa, Are you not my bone and my flesh? God do to, so to me, and more also, if you are not commander of the army before me, continually in the place of Joab. So just picture this, okay? Amasa is Absalom's commander of the army during the Great Rebellion. Joab actually kills the treasonous Absalom for David, for Israel. And David's response is to say, Joab, I'm upset with you for killing my son. I'm going to put Amasa, who was the treasonous commander of the army, as head of my army now. Joab has to deal with this. He was the general of the army that committed treason against David. Now David is going to bring him in. He's done with Joab. He doesn't want Joab. Because what happened with his son Absalom? So he says, Amasa, I'm going to make you the general. Now David knows what a threat Absalom was. In fact, he submitted that in Joab's rebuke when David laments over his son over and over again. And 
And Joab rebukes him for that. So David goes out, back out into the gate. He spoke to the troops comfortably in chapter 20. and verse 6, he speaks of the harm of Absalom. Look what he says. He says, and David said to Abishai, now Sheba, the son of Bichri, will do us more harm than Absalom. So he's at least acknowledging that Absalom had done harm, that he had been treasonous. He says, this man is going to be even worse than Absalom. And at the end of his days, David, remember, is going to advise Solomon to execute this dude, Joab. Why? Well, it's not because he killed his son, Absalom. The reason he gives is because he killed two men. You remember Abner, all the way at the beginning of 2 Samuel? And then this other name, this man, Amasa. It says he shed the blood of war during a time of peace. Didn't mention Absalom. But this is the reason he advises, David on his deathbed advises Solomon, you got to watch out for Joab. The, the man just needs to die. And Joab, of course, gives Solomon opportunity because Joab raises a treasonous revolt against Solomon. And Solomon takes care of that. But for right now, here we have David putting Amasa in the place as the general of the army. And Joab is not going to be happy about that. Not even a little bit. In verse 4, the king said to Amasa, Assemble me, therefore, the the men of of Judah within three days and be here present. This is a a hurried order. David wants to nip this rebellion in the bud quick. And David commands Amasa to assemble the men of Judah, which, by the way, is a really difficult task, right? Remember who Amasa is. He's the leader of the treasonous army of Israel. And now David says, Hey, I want you to rally the troops of Judah. Those who are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Now he's got to bring together all the men of Judah to fight against a new treason. It's asking quite a bit of a man who just fought for treason, isn't it? We find that he couldn't do it. He can't accomplish it. He actually eventually does get a following, but it takes longer. And no doubt the following probably wasn't as large as he wished. So then again, we read in Verse 6, and David said to Abishai, now Sheba, the son of Bichri, will do us more harm than Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue him, lest he find for himself fortified cities and escape us. He knows that he can't afford this powerful, influential man, Sheba, to be on the loose, creating another treasonous situation, more war within the kingdom. Then he, if he can just get the leader, he can stop this. That sounds interesting, doesn't it? Sounds like Ahithophel's plan when he brought that forth to Absalom to destroy David. Here David is learning that lesson. David realizes my kingdom here is vulnerable. In verses 7 and 8 of chapter 20, we read this. So Joab's men with the Cherethites and the Pelethites and all the mighty men went out after him. And they went out of Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. And when they were at the large stone, which is in Gibeon, Amasa came before them. Now Joab was dressed in battle armor. On it was a belt with a sword fastened in its sheath at its hips. And as he was going forward, it fell out. In other words, he has it hidden under his cloak and it's it's loose. It was where he could pull it out really quick, so much so that it fell out upon the ground. Given a little bit of information because he's, well, we see the writing on the wall here, don't we? If you know Joab and you remember Abner, you see what's coming. Verse 9. Then Joab said to Amasa, Are you in health, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. What's interesting here is David actually warned Amasa to be on your guard. And Amasa was not. Joab pretends to care about his welfare. Are you in health, brother? He didn't care about his health. He's about to kill him. He also, notice, pretends to be submissive to the authority of Joab. In fact, if you wanted to show you were submissive to the authority of another man who was in the position of honor, they would take the beards and kiss the beard, which is, in a sense, I'm submitting to your authority. Aren't you glad we didn't have Justin do that, right? Verse 10 tells us, But Amasa did not notice. Be on guard, Amasa. Watch out for Joab, but Amasa did not notice the sword that was in Joab's hand. And he struck him with it in the stomach. And his entrails poured out on the ground. That's for those of you who were hungry. 
And he did not strike him again, thus he died. Massa didn't notice. He was not on his guard. He draws his sword, smites him under the fifth rib. All his insides come out. He doesn't strike him again because he doesn't have to. It's a mortal blow. So Joab has now taken the position once again. And and Joab's men is going to seek to use this event as a unifying cry to reestablish their guy, Joab. Because look what happens in verse 11. Meanwhile, one of Joab's men stood near Amasa, whose insides are on the outside and is dying, who's wallowing. And he said, whoever favors Joab and whoever is for David, follow Joab. Now's the time to talk because you got a man who was a general in the army who's dying before you. He's on the ground. He's wallowing in his blood. And of course, who is going to debate at this point with Joab, right? He's sneaky and he will stab you in the stomach. So I want you to learn something. Take note of something within the text and, and learn to be wise and discerning. Because look what this man said to create this unity He said, whoever favors Joab and whoever is for David, follow Joab. What did he do? He just tied David's name to Joab in order to create this unity, even though they're staring at murder in cold blood right before their very eyes. Friends, beware of people tying together the name of Jesus with all kinds of other things. Sometimes we wonder, why do they do that? Often they do it because they want credibility. Beware, even in the church, friends, there are lots of people who take the name of Jesus or take the name of the Lord in their mouth to try and identify in what is good, even though their purposes are clearly evil. It's what Joab's doing. This man of Joab is doing. So you have this withdrawal. You have this widowhood. Now you have a man wallowing in his blood. Verse 12 tells us this, But Amasa wallowed in his blood in the middle of the highway. When the man saw that all the people stood still, he moved Amasa from the highway to the field and threw a garment over him. When he saw that everyone who came upon him halted. They have a problem now. It's it's a spectacle. He's still rolling around in his blood, and the whole army has stopped to see this spectacle. So if somebody finally removes him and takes him out of the place, covering up Joab's sinful deed... And they continue on with their pursuit of Sheba. Now we come to what is maybe just the most interesting woman in all of the scriptures. This is just astounding. We come to this wise woman. She's an interesting lady. Her name is never given to us, which is good because it means that you don't have to have your name and lights to do the right thing nor to be remembered by God. But look at what happens in this story. And I I tell you, there have been some some great female heroes in pop culture and some people who have saved lives, obviously, even in history. And this woman, her story is amazing. Read this with me in verse 14. And he went through all the tribes of Israel to Abel and Beth Makkah and all the Barites. So they were gathered together and also went after Sheba. Then they came and besieged him in Abel of Beth Makkah, and they cast up a siege mound against the city and stood by the rampart. And all the people who were with Joab battered the wall to throw it down. All right. So so they're after Sheba, this treasonous rebel. They find him in this northern part of Israel. The rebel has flown as far away from Jerusalem as he can and still be in Israel, supposing himself probably be safe up in the city. Apparently, he didn't have his whole army with him anymore. Uh, Because men are fools at heart to think that they will ever escape justice. And even in this life, they they don't usually. And in the next life, we know they sure won't. So in verse 15, the the army has set up camp at the city. And and it's working on setting up a rampart to dismantle part of the wall. They're going to bust it down. And the walls of this city had to be pretty significant in order to do that. I think it's important in our text to understand this. Some time has been spent here in this one verse. They're setting up for war to go into the city. They're to the point where they're trying to batter the wall down, trying to take it down a stone at a time with whatever equipment they had. Surely it seems this city would have inquired as to Joab's intent. What's this man doing trying to break down our wall? Surely they know why this army is there. They shut up the city. So we ask, okay, why are they protecting Sheba? 
Why do they, in essence, join the rebellion by protecting this guy? It seems at least to us, it's ambiguous, but it seems at least to us that the elders, the leaders of the city, the men who are in charge of this thing, they're either at odds with each other or they're conflicted in their own souls about exactly what to do in this situation. Meanwhile, you got an army gathering outside, getting ready to besiege your city. Nothing can get in or out, and they're starting to batter the walls down. And then all of a sudden, we have entering into the picture this, this wise woman of Abel. Same word, by the way, used in Proverbs 46 times for wisdom. Intelligent, skillful, artful. We don't know her name, but she was wise. In many ways, she's wise. She's brave. She calls out to Joab. She's humble. She calls herself a maidservant. She's informed. She can tell them what went on in old times. She's God-fearing. She uses the word shalom for peace. She uses the word faithful. She's a mother in Israel. She has an inheritance from God and is a leader because she goes to the people. We'll see all these things. So the siege has been going on for a while. And where are the men? They're consulting, I guess, in a discussion on what to do with this dude named Sheba who was denied and rebelled against the David of Israel. No one's willing to give up Sheba among all these men. Had he threatened them? Was he bullying them? I don't know. Have the elders even explained the situation to the population? Do they even know what's going on? Now, from the discussion this woman has with Joab, it doesn't appear so. It doesn't appear that, that everyone even knows why the armies are out there ready to batter their wall down. So enter this wise woman and she shows courage. Look at verse 16. Then a wise woman cried out from the city, Hear, hear, please say to Joab, come nearby that I may speak with you. There was a battering of the wall going down, an army lining up outside the city. They were actively trying to tear the wall down and she had the courage to demand a meeting with Joab. And Joab immediately meets that demand. She was a woman of courage and poise, confident of her wisdom. She also showed humility, though, because when she speaks to Joab, notice what she says in verse 17. When he had come near to her, the woman said, Are you Joab? He answered, I am. Then she said to him, Hear the words of your maidservant. And he answered, I am listening. She recognizes and gives due respect to the office that Joab, whether legitimately or illegitimately, took as general of the armies of Israel. She's not berating him. She shows with respect and regard to who he is, the position he has, and she says, I am your maidservant. So she shows courage. She's humble. But look, she was also very much informed, wasn't she? Look at verse 18. So she spoke saying, they used to talk in former times saying they shall surely seek guidance at Abel. So they would end disputes. She was informed about the history of that particular city. See, in that city's history, there's a place that you could go in Abel where wise people in that city would solve problems. So if other people had problems, they could go to Abel. And there they could find the wisdom necessary to solve the problems. She challenges Joab here and says... Have you considered the wisdom of the city yet? In fact, this is, a, this is a principle that's found in the law of God in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 10 through 13, where it says, when you go near a city to fight against it, then proclaim an offer of peace to it. And it shall be that if they accept your offer of peace and open to you, then all the people who are found in it shall be placed under tribute to you and serve you. Now, if the city will not make peace with you, but war against you, then you shall besiege it. You shall strike every male in it with the edge of the sword. Now, what's interesting is this is talking to the enemy of the Israelites, right? But Israel's constantly fighting themselves all the time. But there's a principle here. You go to the city and you try and make peace with it. That's the first step. She asked Joab, hey, Joab, have you tried peace? I don't know. It, it certainly does not necessarily seem like Joab's thing, right? Joab's kind of a grab him by the beard, stab him in the gut sort of guy. So he either did negotiate with the men, they didn't hear, so he battered the wall, or likely Joab just went to work. But at this point, there's a problem with the men of this city one way or the other. So this woman comes and she's courageous, she's humble, she's informed, and then she says, I'm among the peaceable and faithful in Israel. 
She says, I'm a woman of peace, shalom. In all this war, all this killing, all this battering down our city, why are you at war with us when we're at peace with you? doesn't apparently show they were trying to fight these guys up on the wall. There's no indication within the text had the elders withheld this from the people. She doesn't even appear to, to know why they're there unless it's just a rhetorical question. But she's faithful. She says, I'm a faithful worshiper. I'm a worshiper of the one true God, the same God you profess to believe in. So that she therefore deserves a hearing. And then she goes on to say this in verse 19. And I love this. This struck me. I'm among the peaceable and faithful in Israel. You seek to destroy a city and a mother in Israel. Why would you swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? You seek to destroy a mother and a city. That's a sacred name, isn't it? Mother. I think this struck Joab's heart. Think about this mother of Israel. When the men are debating she says, no more of this. We have to stop this. Reminds me of Abigail, right? In 1 Samuel 30. She considers many things, this mother. The protection of her children, surely, who are vulnerable. The protection of the other ladies of her city. The protection of her neighbors, her neighbor's children, her servants, their families. The protection of all of that were vulnerable. It's what mothers do. It's the natural consideration of this mother, which a warrior general may forget, may run roughshod over. The protection of the worshipers in that city. She was a Jehovah worshiper, one of the remnant. That's why she was wise, courageous, brave, and peaceable. Not only is she that, she's decisive. Because she's wise in the way she makes her move. She says, are you going to destroy a mother in Israel? In verse 20, look at what Joab's response is. And Joab answered and said, far be it, far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy now that hasn't necessarily described Joab to us so far, has it? But here's what's interesting. Do you remember who Joab is? This is why we, we look over the names in scriptures, but they're so important. Joab is one of the sons of Zariah. Zariah is not the father. Zariah is the mother. When Joab is mentioned in the scriptures, he's mentioned as the son of his mother, which means the mother in that particular family was either very prominent or the father had died at an early age. We, we don't know. All we know is that the three sons are always talked about as being sons of the mother. But regardless, something here strikes the heart of Joab because Joab no doubt had a strong mother growing up. Her boys were certainly strong, right? They were all generals in the army. And here's a woman of strength as well who speaks to his heart asking, are you going to destroy a mother in Israel? It's, there's no doubt to me that Joab has to think of his own mother here. And he says, far be it from me. That's not my desire. She brings him to understand what he's going to be doing if he invades the city in this way. Verse 21 that is not so. But a man from the mountains of Ephraim, Sheba, the son of Bichri, by name, has raised his hand against the king, against David. Deliver him only, and I will depart from the city. One more thing about this woman. Yeah, she's courageous. She's peaceable. She's informed. She's wise. But look at the rest of verse 21. She also don't play. <laughs> you can write that in your notes. Just write she don't play. Look what happens here. Verse 21. So the woman said to Joab, watch. His head will be thrown to you over the wall. <laughs> I'm sorry. Woo. I hope that you wrote she don't play down. Because uh, she, she knows what needs to be done right now. And then look at verse 22. It says, then the woman in her wisdom went to all the people. She was wise to know that this traitor to Jehovah, to King David, to the anointed one, deserved death. And, and not only that, but she was also wise even to say, watch his head be thrown over the wall. Why didn't she just say, okay, well, we'll open the gates. Come on in and get him. So I don't know if you know much about armies, but sometimes they can probably make a mess of a situation. Other people could have gotten hurt. 
She is guarded concerning Joab and the army. She'll have his head thrown over the wall. See if this is really what you wanted. Making sure that Joab also didn't want revenge for harboring the traitor and causing Joab army, Joab's army all this work. So in many ways, she shows herself to be wise. And, and maybe you're probably thinking this is perhaps not a really fit thing for a woman to say. But this is what's necessary in the moment. This man needed to die. He was a traitor. Matthew Henry writes about Joab. He says, Justly is that place attacked with all its fury, which dares harbor a traitor. Nor will that heart fare better, which indulges those rebellious lusts that will not have Christ to reign over them. He goes on to say, It seems none of all the men of Abel, none of the elders or magistrates, offered a treat with Joab. No, not when they were reduced to the last extremity. They were stupid and unconcerned for the public safety, or they stood in awe of Sheba, or they despaired of gaining any good terms with Joab, or they had not sense enough to manage the treaty. But this one woman, in her wisdom, saved the city. Souls know no difference of sexes. She went to them in her wisdom, and perhaps she had as much need of it in dealing with them as in dealing with Joab, and persuaded them to cut off Sheba's head probably by some public order of their government, and it was thrown over the wall to Joab. The public safety was secured, and he felt no wish to gratify the public revenge. Joab hereupon raised the siege and marched back to Jerusalem. A wise woman, a strong woman, and she saved her city. How careful we must be, however, in applying this text, not to harbor traitors in our own hearts. This is what this city did. All right, you're gonna get the gospel here, right? Think about this. This city was harboring a traitor in their heart, and yet one went out, one of the most unlikely of characters in that time, went out and what? Interceded for the city. But the difference is Jesus put to death our traitor by taking the death upon himself in order to save those of us who belong to the city of God, his children. Friends, do you see this? We harbor traitors in our hearts every day in our sin. We still do it. Spirit of the world and worldliness, these motives, values, and aspirations that don't fulfill Christ's command to seek his kingdom first, they're, they're traitors to our soul. The spirit of false teachers, false doctrine, which can ruin a congregation and turn them from serving Christ. Show your allegiance to King Jesus. His kingdom is to be first and his righteousness is to be boasted in. Jesus came, not as a wise woman, but as the wisest man who ever lived. And yet he was courageous, he was peaceable, but he had to put the traitor of our hearts to death. So he willfully and willingly went and bore the wrath of his father because the trait of our hearts is sin and all the sins that we were committed were placed upon this one who saved the city of God, who saved his children, taking upon the wrath that Sheba deserved and the wrath that we deserved and giving us peace to live safely within the walls that are covered by his blood. I'm going to close with Psalm 123. Unto you I lift my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us. For we are exceedingly filled with contempt. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorn of those who are at ease, with the contempt of the proud. Our allegiance is with the Lord Jesus Christ. We look to him in all that we do. We rid ourselves of the traitors and our hearts, that remnant of sin that still remains. And so here we have a second traitor in the book of 2 Samuel. He comes to an untimely end as well. The first by the hand of Joab, the second one by the hand of this government, once they're instructed by this woman who had the courage and wherewithal by the grace of God to save her city. May the Lord help us to understand the depth of his wisdom in saving us, 
the depth of his fight for peace and putting to death the traitors of our hearts. And may the Lord give us both strong men and women within the congregation who are wise, courageous, humble, faithful, informed, who desire peace, who are decisive, so we can all aim to do our Father's will together. Would you stand as we close this morning? Father, how faithful you are to give us such a wonderful picture of the gospel through what we might consider an unlikely character. And yet, um, Father, I'm thankful even in my life for the wise women. Uh, as I was even writing this week, so many reminders of the wonderful, beautiful women in, in my life who are wise, who are faithful, who show and display the peace of Christ. Um, but Lord, ultimately, remind us who we are in this story. We're not the wise woman in this story. We're Sheba. We're traitors who deserve to have our heads thrown over the wall. But yet you, in your love and your kindness and your grace, Lord, you, you made those who are Sheba's part of the home in heaven. And Lord, you, Father, came and bore the wrath that we deserve to die in our stead and in our place. Thank you, Father, for your work. Thank you um, for these wonderful examples you've set before us in our word. Lord, help us even now to put to death the traitors of our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We come to our time of invitation. Um, clearly for the church, there are a lot of examples to follow here in the Old Testament, not necessarily saying you need to go decapitate somebody, um, but... Uh, you do need to decapitate the traitors of your heart. <laughs> um, put those to death willingly and actively. And the reality is, church family, we, we just, we really just don't put in the work constantly to do battle with sin. There is a, um, there is something that's happening, I believe, in our culture where our answer now, as opposed to dealing with the issues of sin in our own heart, is just to turn off everything and attempt to distract ourselves with the many distractions that our culture allows for us uh, to endure. Um, but friends, the, the problems are still there and the Spirit of God, if He's dwelling within you, um, is actively putting those things to death. Would you be filled with the Spirit in such a way where you'd be seeking active obedience in looking at the traitors of your heart? laying them at the feet of Jesus, seeing the damage they do to your life and your walk and to the testimony of Christ and simply put them to death by the power of his spirit. Um, may we all be about that as Christians. As, may we all help each other in that. Listen, again, there is a, um, there's a general idea of church that we have to come out of that I can't let anybody know the issues of my heart because then they'll talk about me or they'll you know, know that I'm not perfect, but friends, we are the family of God. First and foremost, gossiping is a sin. And so if somebody's gossiping about you and you know it to be true, you need to come to your elders so that we can discipline that because it's ungodly and it will cause people not to lovingly bring forward their sins so that we can do what we're meant to do, which is encourage one another in this battle with sin. Fight alongside each other as brothers and sisters, knowing the pangs and difficulties of this world and yet seeking to live for Christ together. And so I know maybe in the past you've brought out something that you're struggling with in your heart and you've been what we call church hurt by people who in the church. And I'm so sorry that's happened to you. But friends, it does not excuse you to therefore live your life separate from the body of Christ. We are to do life together. Did you know that? And, and that, listen, that together doesn't mean we just sit in the same room. It means we bear one another's burdens. We seek to actively love and engage in fellowship with one another that we are here for each other. That's what God's called us to be as a church. So maybe you've got traitors in your heart and you're just either too ashamed or too afraid to make those known to your brothers and sisters, know that what you're missing out on there is a wonderful tool given by God to help you and encourage you in the times of difficulty. My brother Brad in Sunday school said it this morning. There's been so many times in his life where brothers and sisters in the church would come to him and speak such truth in his life at the exact time 
that he needed it. And my heart felt at that moment, I wonder how many times, I wonder how many times that the Spirit has really encouraged someone to speak into my life or encouraged me to speak in others' lives. And I've been too afraid of either what they would think or whether I know them well enough or not or what it would look like. And I would hate that. So friends, if, if the Spirit of God is working in you, continue to be sensitive and know that we are together. I've said this often to people in my office. If you are a part of our family, uh, and you know this about the Page family too, um, but if you are part of our church family, there's, there ain't nothing you can do to me that I'm not gonna love you. I, because, I, because you're my family. I promise I will choose to love you. And I say that yet not I, but Christ in me, right? That's why I know. And so friends, if there's anything that we need to deal with that we walk through together, please don't ever be ashamed or afraid to walk through the Christian life together as we bear the burdens of one another. The Lord just laid that on my heart. And particularly if you don't know yourself to be a Christian, friends, then I pray that you'd hear the gospel message this morning. Here that you are deserving of sin and death because of your breaking of your creator's law. He created you for a purpose to bring honor and glory to his name. And you've rejected that good and right purpose. Instead, bringing honor and glory to yourself, to creation, instead of the creator. Yet in his great love for you, he sent his son Jesus to be fully obedient to his law. Jesus who never sinned, therefore never deserved death. Who lived the life that you and I should have lived but could not live. And then... Jesus willing went to the cross to pay the sacrifice for you and I's sin, to take upon himself the wrath of his father for the sins that you and I deserved. You and I did. Jesus willingly bore that and gave us the gift of his righteousness so that you and I could stand before God covered in his blood. The only way anybody stands before a holy God is if they themselves are holy. The problem is that you and I are not holy, but Jesus is, and he covers us even in his righteousness so that we can stand before God holy and blameless as a spotless bride, even though there's still sin in our hearts we need to put to death. If you would but repent of your sins, turn away from living your life as a rebel and, and turn towards Christ who is the Son, and believe in his finished work on the cross and that God raised him from the dead, then today you can walk out of here assured that you know Christ.